Good afternoon and welcome to this plenary on justice system, power, violence and responsibility of civil society. But we, before we start, I would like to say that as noted in the more detail in the opening ceremony, we would like to acknowledge that we that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the indigenous people of this region. My name is Marina Kulkchan, and I am honored to act as a chair of this session, being co-organizer of the plenary together with Kalpana Kanabiran. We have four distinguished speakers at the panel, and believe you, we have four. One will come, uh, who kindly accepted our invitation to come and share with us their thoughts with reference to their works and social context. Our speakers will discuss the ways in which state and non-state institutional processes inhibit or enhance delivery of justice. Due to the limitation of time, my introduction of our speakers has to be very brief, and therefore I cannot make justice to all their achievements and contributions. Hopefully, and if we still have some time left after all, your questions will be gladly answered by our speakers. Therefore, I'll just move on and present our first speaker, who is Professor Arturo Alvarado, the director of the Center for Sociological Studies at the University El Colegio de Mexico. He has dedicated much of his career to studying human rights, delivery of justice, criminality, urban governance, and democracy in Latin America. He is the author, uh, or co-author, of 18 monographs and numerous well-cited papers in leading journals. At different stages of his career, he worked in various capacities in the University of Sorbonne, Paris III, Brown University, Massachusetts University of Technology, the Woodrow Wilson Center for Research, and the Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard. In addition to this extensive teaching and research activities, Professor Alvarado frequently consulted and has been involved in large projects with international organizations such as UN Women, UN Habitat, UNDP, the World Bank, Mexico's uh, Attorney General, and others. He has funded organizations to promote human rights and democracy and violence prevention. And with this short introduction, I would like to give the floor to Professor Alvarado to deliver his paper on access to justice in the context of precarious state institutions. Please join me in welcoming him. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. I am delighted uh, to be in this panel, and I thank the organizers for this, together with my colleagues that I'm gonna uh, present this paper together today. The paper presents and examines the difficult choices citizens in Latin America have to confront when trying to access justice, or also trying to solve their grievances, disputes, or conflicts. I will examine the many ways that people at disadvantage disadvantage, interpret, perceive, and use what I will define as institutions of justice. The presentation is based on my work on justice on Latin America, where there are consist contesting ideas of what is fair, what is legitimate, and what are the legal pro procedures to follow when you have a dispute. The, the main problem and the main question is what institutions of justice are better fitted to build a democratic rule, in, rule of law in the region. Among several challenges to justice are structural inequalities, social exclusion and discrimination along ethnic, racial, and gender lines. All of them contribute to erosion or violation of basic human rights by state actors, non-state actors, informal powers, criminal networks, and sometimes from large national business corporations in the region. Since I have a limited time to, uh, time to do 
the, the presentation. I'm just gonna show a couple of slides during my presentation and then go into one more discussion. Citizens in various situations in the sub subcontinent have to respond in different ways to conflicts, deprivations, when trying to solve their grievances. Disputes in different settings, using other than, I mean, legal and other types of non-legal system is always a choice and an alternative in order to access to justice. For this, and before I continue, we need to have a couple of definitions of what I'm gonna work uh, in this paper. I will understand institutions of justice as the norms, the customs, the practices, the organizations and its procedures that can be either formal or not formal. Justice in this case is referred to a set of ideas or conceptions about fairness and fair procedures and always sometimes, or always you can mention that, they are referred to institutions such as court, judges and other types of authorities. And access to justice will be understood as the ability of people to seek and obtain a remedy to grievances, disputes or conflicts through either formal or informal institutions. What I wanna point or stress in this presentation is it is important to go beyond the institutional, legal, socio-legal orientations of access to justice and try to center the interpretation in the persons and in the, and in the citizens. Any uh, institutional consideration about access to justice and any outcome have, have to be measured by and from the individual's perspectives. And in this study, I also need to integrate some structural limitations or barriers to justice, such as gender barriers. I'm not gonna be able to really go on that much into this topic, but this is an important one. There are also other barriers or structural determinants like discrimination by exclusion. And there is one very important environmental problem in the region that I wanna point out as a barrier, as a barrier and that has been on the study of this Congress today, that is violence. Either at the level of the individual, at the collective, at the social, or uh, the structural, this is one of the main uh, environmental conditions that limited, limits access to justice for most of the population. Then the next issue to be, I mean, to try to understand this, this topic is what is the magnitude of the problem of injustice and what types of alternatives the people has in order to address them. I don't have the time either to go into the rights and entitlements and in general the, all the uh, rights that the people try to fulfill throughout everyday life, but I wanna stress and point out a couple of very important exceptional situations in, in Latin America that are also mark of this problem of access to justice. I refer to the high intensity or seriousness or certain offenses and violations. And by that, there is a set of problems that I wanna point out. The first one, for instance, is confrontations among criminal gangs or between one criminal gang and a corporation from the state that results in several killings massacres of 10, 30, 50 people that occur continuously in Mexico, in Colombia, in Central America, and in Brazil are one important issue to consider when trying to address this problem. The other main problem is gender crimes that are not also related to everyday intimate, par intimate partner violence, but also to the great problem of feminicides that are prevalent and continuous in most of the region. And also, to children's rights violations that are also rampant and part of the contemporary human rights crisis that we are living in North America. This crisis is based of the, with experiences of children, migrant children, concentration in detention centers in the United States that should be released immediately and reintegrated with their parents. And this case confronts us with other important issues in the conception of justice because even though there might be legal regulations to separate children from their parents in detention centers because they are supposed to be illegal or they are violating certain norms of the country, there is no justice in the protection of the, of the, of the children, nor in the administrative measure, neither a fair solution of the problem of migration, immigration and the respect for children's rights. 
We can also mention a large number of other types of problems like displacements, forced displacements from populations in Colombia and Mexico and Central America. Disappearances are becoming one of the most important other issue in the region. And forced disappearances today are not only uh, related to actions of the state, but also actions of a combination of state and non-state criminal actors, which is another major problem we are trying to achieve. Now, for the presentation, what I did is, uh, I'll go to a fast explanation of this. We have been doing a study of juvenile justice and access to justice in 10 cities in Latin America. What we are doing with collective and individual uh, interviews and interviews with the justice system is trying to find out three things. First. What are the conceptions of legality, the conceptions of justice and legitimacy of both the legal normative system and the organizations of justice, state organizations? The second one we are trying to get into this thing is what are the alternatives that people tend to choose when they go in order to try to solve the disputes? And for this, we got into a set of, uh, can I return this thing? Yeah. I said of eight types of alternatives. If there is time for discussion, I'll go a little bit more into this idea and try to do some explanations. So what we did is we classified the people's responses to any type of grievances and see what, how does they try to solve them. Of course, there are two main findings in the story. There is a large group of people that does nothing, unfortunately, and there is another large people that the first response to any offense is violence. And this is a learned process that also limits the alternatives that they have to produce a fair solution of this problem. But other than that, I established eight types of, of alternatives and then I'll try to go into a fast explanation of these alternatives. The first one for sure is the state formal procedural system of justice, which includes also, it's always within a framework of norms and legality Sometimes it's constitutional, sometimes it's human rights, international frameworks. The second one is what I call a procedural practice of the police. Even though this is very disputable because when you go into analyzing the relations between the police and the people, most of the times, because police is the first actor that they confront when they have a conflict, most of the times the procedural justice is arbitrary, is case by case situation, and involves a lot of other two problems that the state has, that is corruption and impunity. The problem is that people tend to get trapped systematically when trying to start going into the, 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 the public justice system. The third one is what I call divine justice. Is operated by church ministers or pastors based on religions or biblical ideas or some hierarchical codes. The, the fifth one is pr practices exerted by symbolic, hierarchical, important persons, sometimes a patron, sometimes caciques, sometimes other types of people. And then there are three other types that tend to be more collective solutions to, I mean, to justice. One being the indigenous arrangements, which several states in the region have already included in the institutional system of justice that are tradition, practices, they tend to be collective sometimes by teams and includes procedures like community policing or community or collective justice. Then the other one is more a typical collective vengeance that goes from lynchings to other types of vigilantes and other types of exclusion of persons and even complete communities from the regions. And finally, some mutual arrangements between families, groups, persons, and individuals. Okay, from here on, in the last time I have, I'd like to pose three ideas of why does the people tend to use this type of solutions and what will be the sociological as well as other alternatives to justice. In the first part of the, of the paper, I put, I put out some ideas about that justice has to do with fairness and has to do with, and it's based of back into a, uh, sociological theory of public choice and public justice. But there are other things that has to be considered in a more broader sociological analysis of this, of this problem. 
there are three types of ideas. Usually justice has to be part of the integration of the people to the system, integration of the norms, socialization of the norms. The second is part of integrative norms and institutions into the system. And the third one has a redistributive uh, function into the social system. What I'll try to do now is just go into a couple of explanations with this. Social actors, when trying to solve disputes, make calculations of the alternatives and the likelihood of solving a complaint of dispute. And when comparing state to non-state options, endemic corruption, impunity, and also the possibility or the necessity to pay the services of the, of the public sector is always included in this calculation. Also, it is important to, important to notice that in most of the cases and most of the alternatives, the possible outcomes in each case involve some form of coercion, either from the person that is uh, trying to access justice or from the person that is supposedly producing this aggression. And then uh, from here, uh, there are three final ideas that I wanna point out in order to make an explanation of this. Uh, of course, the first explanation can be the low capacity or the fragile capacity and coverage of state institutions. Also, the low legitimacy and the low efficacy. But in a way, this is also something to, to need to be a little bit, need more explanation that I will provide now. The second alternative is what I call, when people try to go to solve the disputes, the system has several alternatives. And we can uh, explain or interpret this to what is, um, what will be framed within the base of Durkheim and Mertonian framework either from social integration into the normative system to social deviation as an alternative that people use in order to solve problems within the state system. And the third one is more a political, uh, a political institution-oriented alternative. The politics of justice might provide explanations of this puzzle cell of alternatives of justice and may be based not only on the failure of the state that I mentioned before, but also in several other practices operated today by political coalitions that include not only corruption, but also include clientelism and other predatory practices, not only from the police, but also involves in certain cases, the collusion or the integration or the complicity between state and non-state actors in order to produce what I would call a mechanism of social control and political domination of the citizens in the region. So these reasons why paradoxically residents in, point, in, point, in poor neighborhoods resort to several times to other options than the state justice that are called usually informal, but not only are informal, there are several types of other forms, or to the police, always have a difficult outcome. By using non-state procedures, and not only state procedures, people to be subject of two different sets of autocrats. They are not free citizens, they are not autonomous actors within neither the state or out of the state system. And the problem with the majority of the alternative is that the rule of law will be continuing to be low and a non-democratic condition will be installed in the society with strong impact on the quality of citizenship. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Our next speaker is Professor Vadim Volkov, director of the European Institute in St. Petersburg, Russia. After obtaining degrees from the University of Cambridge in the UK, he chose to return to Russia in 1995 to invest his knowledge and energy into developing the field of law and society in Russia, and also actively contribute to the transformation of the educational landscape in the country. He was one of the leading forces to launch and then build up the European University Institute. University. Vadim has conducted extensive research on post-Soviet Russian mafia and the use of force in the early years of the transition. Later, as Russian mafia went distinct, 
Folk have turned to empirical studies of the courts and the police, judges, and law enforcement. <clears throat> he is one of the most influential and most cited Russian so sociologists in foreign language publications. Volkov created and is leading a research structure, the Institute for Rule of Law, which accumulated highly praised by scholars in both Western and Russian academia, rich empirical data offers in-depth knowledge how the institution of justice works in Russia. And very importantly, is engaged with policymakers to bring changes and improve delivery of justice. Today, he will be talking on the sociology of law as public sociology. Can, can empirical research enhance justice? Please. Thank you. <clears throat> so the idea of uh, good laws and equality before the law has long uh, been the driving force of social movements. Uh, the law is now widely regarded as an instrument of social change and battles are fought over the letter of law. Uh, the focus of public attention is typically placed on the text of law itself, uh, on changing it. <clears throat> and the civil society has demonstrated impressive achievements. Discriminatory laws have been uh, repealed or amended. New legislation promoting equality before the law was enacted. However, in the end, what matters is law in practice. This includes, for example, millions of decisions routinely made by the systems of criminal or civil justice, reactions of companies or individuals to new legislation. The law in practice or law in action depends upon decisions by thousands of officials endowed with the power to check other people's behavior against legal rules to interpret these rules and apply them for various ends, such as reducing or enhancing other people's rights. <coughs> Punishment, especially incarceration, transfers of property, compensations, they all represent justice in action. They are about effects of laws rather than laws themselves. But unlike laws on paper, laws on practice have always, always been very difficult to assess, to objectify, and even more difficult to change. It is not only that the application of laws involves uh, uniform behavior of hundreds of thousands of officials. The translation of written rules into behavioral patterns is very far from a simple and straightforward process. Methods of jurisprudence uh, can do little to predict or assess the actual effects of law. To assess the use of laws, one needs to observe the behavior of legal officials, check it against the law, and explain regular deviations if these occur. And here sociology comes to rescue. Observing the behavior of legal officials is an empirical task requiring data, proper methods, and frameworks of interpretation. <clears throat> and of course, initial research questions that bear the recognizable, critical, cognitive style of sociological research. Ever since the inception of empirical sociology of law by Thorsten Selen in 1928, uh, <clears throat> when he looked at how blacks and whites are punished for the same type of offense, the issue of social inequalities in the use of law, of unequal chances of winning one's case in court, have been the central theme of empirical research. <clears throat> the main directions of empirical social research on the law in action are now situated within several disciplinary fields, such as sociology of law, criminology, law and society, empirical legal studies. Brands that depend upon mainly the met methodological arsenal. At the cross-section of these fields, there emerge several directions of empirical research that are of interest here. These are sentencing research, organizational studies of courts and police, research over the mobilization of law, studies of professional cultures of uh, <coughs> legal professionals. What they have in common is their understanding of law as behavior and their focus on data-rich empirical research. What have they achieved uh, and what can be achieved? 
I will very briefly review some research problems, then give examples from the research of my institution, and then finish with the main argument of this presentation, <coughs> namely that empirical sociology of law can achieve most by way of being public sociology, but that this may have to, but for that it may have to make certain sacrifices. <coughs> sentencing research have been concerned with effects of the social structure on sentencing by courts. In particular, with effects of race, ethnicity, class, status, gender, uh, of defendant upon the type and severity of punishment. In USA, the major focus has been on racial disparities of punishment, including capital punishment. The main challenge, uh, obviously, was to separate legally significant factors of punishment, such as seriousness of crime or criminal history, from extra-legal characteristics of uh, offenders that should have no role in the sentencing process. So there were over 80 data sets uh, containing tens and hundreds of thousands of observations, and <coughs> using them, American scholars did show that courts tend to assign harsher punishment to blacks and Hispanics, as well as to the unemployed. <coughs> scholars also found that young black males are regarded as a dangerous class by the criminal justice because the combination of this social characteristic dramatically increases chances of imprisonment as compared to other defendants for the same crimes. Today, while, while blacks constitute about 13% of the population, their share of prisoners in the USA is over 50%. And one in nine blacks aged between 25 and 34 is behind bars. These figures continue to drive the research effort further. And the new wave of research shifted its focus from the focus on the <coughs> prosecutorial discretion and police arrests. It was found that even stronger disparities emerge at pretrial stages where police and prosecution use their legal discretion to disadvantage to the disadvantage of non-whites. That was made possible only by obtaining new data on arrests and behavior of the prosecution, as well as by the progress of statistical modeling. <coughs> Still in the USA, the USA is a fragmented jurisdiction. Most of the cases are tried in uh, state courts, not on, in the federal courts, and there's no uniform sentencing data. But in countries such as the Netherlands, Brazil, Israel, the Czech Republic, and Russia, Scholars have at their disposal rich and uniform criminal justice statistics, which leads to a rapid progress in sentencing research. So here is a uh, social composition of all defendants in Russia's criminal courts, um, and it's stable, it's for one year, but it's stable over time. So we do immediately see that criminal justice, in full accordance with the Marxist critique, targets low class, working class, and <coughs> marginal elements in society. So 88% of defendants uh, belong to the lowest strata of society. And also we found that uh, the, the unemployed have 10% high chances of imprisonment for the same cri crimes in the same legal circumstances compared to those who have a job. Uh, this is just a, a, a graph showing, showing a graphical representation of sentencing disparities between different status groups for uh, uh, sentence for fraud, uh, white collar crime. Baseline is manual workers, and it shows that, uh, and it's a quantile regression which, uh, which differentiates uh, uh, sentencing uh, according to the severity of crime or <coughs> uh, and it shows that punishments for businessmen and top managers as compared to public official or law enforcers are much higher and that there is the instrumental use of justice by the state against the economic class. So while sentencing research convincingly reveals extra-legal disparities, 
uh, and discrimination in sentences, it doesn't offer much by way of uh, interpretation. Uh, in contrast to that, uh, the application of organizational theory and institutional analysis to the work of courts and the police allows formulating frameworks explaining variations in the application of laws in the use of legal discretion by judges, prosecutors, and the police. Organizational constraints and specific professional cultures do shape the way lawyers or legal officials go about their work. Sociology had a lot to contribute to diagnosing and explaining problems with low quality of legal protection, excessive use of discretion, conviction bias, uh, standardization of individual case processing and the like, all of them which follow, follow, all of which follow from the organizational capture of the legal profession. The managerial KPI style approach to justice destroys its ethical core. The triumph of organizational efficiency <coughs> quietly kills justice itself. To give you an example, just to give you an example from our research, we did a survey of <coughs> judges and found out that as the key legal principles of judicial independence and life tenure were introduced in Russia, an increasing number of judges, over one third now, are being recruited from the ranks of court clerks, secretaries or assistants. Uh, so before judges are given independence and life tenure, they do go through a school of routine bureaucratic and office work through evaluation according to the degree of obedience and discipline under the supervision of the chairman of the court. So this is how socialization within an organization neutralizes any future demand for independence. Good empirical studies based on comprehensive data, surveys, or direct observations are part of the story. A no less important part is that of public sociology. <clears throat> it is about using these studies to actually communicate with legal professionals and with authorities in order to advance the cause of the civil society to improve the quality of justice. Uh, <clears throat> I just put the quote from, famous quote from Michael Burawoy, I won't uh, 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 read it, that the key idea of public sociology is return the knowledge back to the audiences, to the people, from, to the groups from where you've taken it initially. Communicate your results to other professional communities. Transform your uh, research findings into uh, easily understandable uh, <coughs> results and policy recommendations. Uh, <coughs> communicate with uh, public officials with the language of facts, which are hard to ignore. So back in the 1980s, socio-legal uh, socio scholars brought their findings to the attention of American judiciary and convinced authorities to introduce sentencing reforms. Uh, the result was the creation of sentencing committees and sentencing guidelines, reducing the discretion of judges. In the 2010s, sentencing reform started in UK, and again, studies of sentencing disparities have played a key role in convincing the authorities. Now, the one of the recent interesting cases is the so-called Lamy Report, the analysis of sentencing bias against black, Asian, minority, and ethnic defendants commissioned by uh, the Labour MP, David Lamy. And the report was prepared by scholars uh, who did sentencing research, and now it, this report is positioned to produce a, a policy impact in United Kingdom. Uh, Empirical sociology of law should utilize the opportunities of the data revolution. Uh, studies of the mobilization of law that took, uh, that look at the, at the variations of the degree of success with which different social groups use the law for their interests uh, is uh, one of the key dimensions of research where big data can be utilized. 
because data analysis enables monitoring interaction between citizens and police authorities, for example, and prevents selective reactions to citizens' requests. I will now show a, uh, I will now show a short clip that uh, reports the results of our experimental work uh, on using neural networks, n neural network to classify reports to the police. This is a pilot project using data from uh, six regions, about uh, four and a half million uh, short reports to the police. The problem is that every year police departments in the country receive about 20 million calls from citizens. But the police initiates about two million uh, criminal prosecutions. And no one knows the contents of these calls uh, no one can look at them, in, into them, and the police, therefore, has huge opportunities to conceal crime or to react selectively. New technologies can empower the prosecutor's office uh, that supervises the police work and increase uh, the transparency in the citizens to police interaction. Каждый год в дежурные части полиции поступает до 26 миллионов обращений. Люди звонят по самым разным поводам. А все эти обращения вносятся в книгу учета сообщений о происшествиях. На протяжении последних 60 лет обращения граждан заносились оперативным дежурным в бумажные журналы. Поэтому обобщить и проанализировать эти данные было практически невозможно. Благодаря созданию системы ГАЗ «Правовая статистика» сообщения стали вноситься в компьютер. Но человеку потребовался бы почти год, чтобы только прочитать все эти обращения в полицию. Тут на помощь человеку приходит искусственный интеллект. Мы натренировали нейросеть понимать и классифицировать почти 4,5 миллиона сообщений к УСП на 40 содержательных категорий. В нейросети каждое слово представлено как вектор, а каждое сообщение — как точка в 200-мерном семантическом пространстве. Это позволяет понять содержание миллионов сообщений, не читая их. Теперь мы можем узнать, с чем обращаются в полицию, моделировать реакцию правоохранительных органов, оптимизировать ее, а в будущем иметь детальные данные о преступности в реальном времени. So the idea is that the new uh, technologies of data analysis can actually control the work of the police and monitor how the police reacts to citizens' appeals. So to conclude, research of law in action uh, brings together several disciplines and empirical sociology of law is one of them. In this enterprise, sociology is, is not a majority shareholder. Moreover, to to participate in empirical legal studies, it has to drop many of its elaborate interpretive frameworks. The present day empirical research is data rich, but theory poor. Still, <coughs> by engaging with professional publics and policymakers, sociology can increase its status and impact. So this is a trade-off that faces our discipline today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joan Vermeers, professor at the School of Criminology of the Université de Montréal, as well as principal researcher at the International Center for Comparative Criminology and a member of the Canadian Partnership on International Justice. Professor Vermeers has published widely in the areas of victimology, international criminal law, and restorative justice. Her very recent book published last year, Victimology, a Canadian Perspective, has already been translated into French. In 2015, she was awarded a certificate of appreciation by the World Society of Victimology for her contributions to the field. Previously editor-in-chief of the French journal Criminology, she is currently editor of the International Review of Victimology. And today, Joanne will share with us her findings of research and speak on justice for victims of crime. Please welcome Joanne. Thank you. 
Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here with you in Toronto today. Victims demand justice, politicians promise justice, but what does justice mean? Today, I will address research on the meaning of justice for victims, the state's ability to provide justice for victims, how it affects victims' recovery, their healing, and their trust or confidence in the criminal justice system. But first, we have to look at why is justice essential for victims? And that takes us to the question of uh, human needs. Now, today, due to time constraints, I'll be covering these topics very quickly. They're covered in more detail, of course, in the paper that I worked out for today's presentation, as well as in uh, my book that uh, was mentioned with um, the University of Toronto Press. So, moving on, the need for justice. What are human needs, and is justice a human need? The philosopher Erwin Staub says that justice is a precondition for the fat satisfaction of basic human needs. And he describes a need for security, uh, for example, that all people share, a need to comprehend the world or, or the reality uh, around us, a need to feel effective, to have control over our lives, as well as a need for a positive identity. We want to feel good about ourselves, and a need for positive connections with others. Now, those of us working in victimology have been uh, quick to highlight the similarities between these fundamental human needs and the needs often expressed by victims of crime as they navigate the criminal justice system. Well, the fulfillment of victims' basic human needs, and therefore justice as a precondition for the satisfaction of these needs, is essential for victims' effective functioning and growth, and without it, they may have difficulty healing. Failure to satisfy human needs leads to frustration and conflict. But then, what is justice? Now, uh, much of my work in justice and perceptions of justice is rooted in social psychology. Uh, here I present the model developed by uh, Colquitt uh, on uh, uh, justice as a multidimensional concept. Um, in his model, there are four dimensions. Procedural justice, which according to him refers to the formal procedures or rules in decision-making process. For example, in the legal context, we would refer to it as um, procedural law. Uh, as well as interpersonal justice, which is about how we are treated by other people. Uh, are we treated with dignity, respect, in a polite manner, uh, with consideration? Informational justice, about notification, providing people with explanations, letting them know what's going on, uh, how things will proceed. And these latter two, interpersonal, informational justice, are often treated together as interactional justice, referring to the informal treatment of people as opposed to the formal rules that we see in procedural justice. And then finally, distributive justice. Now, distributive justice refers to fair distribution of outcomes, values, and norms for the distribution of resources. Um, now, much of the work done on this by, for example, Morton Deutsch, uh, who did a lifetime of research on distributive justice. He identifies different values that can um, define uh, what is a fair distribution. And depending on the context or the goal, that will vary. And he identifies three, equity, equality, and need. Uh, equity, we're all familiar with. It's based on inputs, outcomes. Uh, the harder you work, the more you should uh, gain. Uh, the more serious the crime, the more severe the punishment. The idea of proportionality or balance. And these types of fair distributions, or this describes distributions that are fair in, for example, um, work environments. Uh, and according to uh, Deutsch, they foster, this type of distribution fosters economic productivity and competition, and hence something we often see in a, in a work environment. Other values for what would constitute a fair distribution is um, equality. Now, we often think of equality as the same. Everyone gets the same. Um, but Deutsch is quick to point out that it can also be recognizing the equal value of all humans. So there we see the importance from a human rights perspective of recognizing the, uh, the values of individual as opposed to the outcome per se. And for Deutsch, these types of distributions, ones based on equality, uh, foster positive social relations and social harmony. Very important when we talk about, for example, uh, conflict uh, and, and peace and criminal justice. And finally, need-based distributions that are um, about meeting the needs of the individual. Now, this could be about meeting the needs of the individual victim. 
uh, or it could alternatively be about meeting the needs of the, uh, the individual offender in the context of rehabilitation of the offender or healing of the victim. Um, importantly, these types of distributions foster personal development and personal welfare or healing. Again, very important from a victim-centered approach. Okay, so what does this mean? This means justice is multidimensional. Um, the research tells us that these four dimensions are substitutable as well. So that's important because often people won't have access to all four dimensions. They'll have some information. They might know the outcome, but not necessarily how that outcome was uh, achieved. Or they might know the process, but we don't know yet the outcome. And they will use whatever information is available to them in order to form their justice just judgments. We also know that these I dimensions interact with one another. And so, for example, research has shown that what comes first matters. So if, for example, I have process information first and I don't yet know the outcome, that my overall justice judgment, even when I later know the outcome, will be more strongly influenced by that which I knew first, which was process information. And hence, fair procedures have been found to cushion uh, the effects of more uh, unfavorable outcomes which is very important when we're trying to think about how can we uh, offer justice to victims. Now, what about the state's ability to provide justice to victims? Now, victims look to the criminal justice system to provide them with justice. Um, now, fair outcomes uh, are, the state is very limited in its ability uh, to apprehend and sanction offenders. Just in preparing today's uh, uh, presentation, these are statistics that came from Statistics Canada. Um, we know, as other speakers have said, most victims don't report crime to the police. If they do, in Canada at least, uh, two out of every three uh, um, violent offenders is charged, and among them, only one out of every two violent offenders is found guilty, which means that if, if justice is defined in terms of sanctioning and punishing offenders, many victims may be disappointed because clearly there are limitations in what the criminal justice system can offer. Um, what about those victims then who, who um, their offender is sentenced? Well, research shows that, um, for example, Orth in uh, Austria and Herman in the States, that when victims uh, look at sentencing, what their, their goals or their, um, the, the basis on which they think fair distributions are, are made are largely associated with the well-being of society, general deterrence, personal well-being as well of the victim, reducing risk of victimization or prevention, not punishment, not revenge, and not imposing suffering on the offender. Now, this is important because um, it, I think, uh, challenges some of our conventional notions about punishment or sanctioning. Now, what about those people who don't have access then to distributive justice, procedural justice, or the rules we said, governing um, the, the legal procedures, for example? Very interesting research done by Laxmanari and Heinrichs and uh, Pemberton, where they looked at victims' procedural rights and their justice judgments in a country using an inquisitorial procedure, the Netherlands, where victims can be a civil party. They are rarely asked to testify and therefore rarely undergo cross-examination, and they can uh, make a victim impact statement versus the state of South Australia, where victims in this adversarial system are witnesses to a crime against the state. Um, they are often asked to testify, and if they do, they will be cross-examined, and in the end, they can make a victim impact statement. And their findings show that victim participation or legal rights, so in the Netherlands in particular, victims felt they had more control in the criminal justice process. And this was associated with a stronger sense of justice. So that's interesting in the, in the context of uh, procedural rights for victims. In Canada, we've had a huge discussion about charter rights for victims that were recently introduced, still without any sort of legal um, backing, however. And the lack of legal rights for victims in many criminal justice systems means that there is little room for procedural justice. And this makes interactional justice all the more important, or how victims are treated all the more important. Uh, in fact, some research is showing that victims are surprised by the very marginal role that they play in the criminal justice system. They find this humiliating, and as a result, they are even more sensitive to how they are treated. Interactional justice, as I said, is about interpersonal justice and informational justice, how people are treated. And there, people tend to feel that they were treated fairly if they were, had an uh, opportunity to express themselves, if they feel that their voice was heard, um, if they feel that they were recognized in the procedures. Validation, as well, is very important. This idea of 
validating their, their social value, that they are important members of society and they count and what happens to them matters. Um, also informational justice as a re can be a reflection of that as well, notifying victims. Um, we saw the question of security being very important and victims often enter the criminal justice system feeling very uncertain, not knowing what's going to happen. And information can reduce uncertainty, give them a little bit more certainty, uh, idea of what's going to happen, what is happening and recognizes the victim and their legitimate interest in the case. So it's been found to enhance victims' sense of justice, their justice judgments. Now this is a quick little table about um, from the re some of the research I did with one of my grad students, and it shows the interaction between victims' expectations in terms of do you expect that you will be notified or, or not, whether or not you receive information or notified about the developments in your case, and their justice judgments. Now, what you see, first of all, is that roughly half the victims expected to receive information. And expectations are important. That shouldn't surprise people. If you expect information and you receive it, you tend to have more, the, those are the, whoops, the strongest evaluations of justice in that group versus those who expected notification and didn't receive it. And they are the lowest justice judgments. So there you see a sense of um, disappointment. And those who did not expect information are in the middle between the two extremes. So it shows you the importance of information. In particular, new policies emphasizing victims' rights, like a new charter, creates an expectation. And it's very important that we respect that, meet that expectation. Otherwise, the impact can be quite strong on people's justice judgments. Now, I see the clock ticking, and we still have things to talk about. So justice and healing, or secondary victimization, how does this then impact victims' recovery? Well, one of the things I look at in my research are victims' fairness, the justice judgments, uh, perceptions of fairness, and their PTSD symptoms. And what I have found is that when victims are um, notified, they receive information, uh, when they feel they've been treated in a respectful, polite manner, this is associated with strong feelings of a just, fair treatment. And when they feel they've been treated fairly, they tend to have um, less PTSD symptoms. Also, what's interesting is this was longitudinal research, and at time one, the type of victimization, so was it a violent crime or a theft, for example, as well as the treatment were associated with PTSD symptoms. But in the long term, only fair treatment continued to be significantly associated with victims' PTSD symptoms. How police treat victims may sometimes have a more lasting effect on victims' recovery than the type of victimization experienced. Now, moving on. Uh, fairness and their confidence in the criminal justice system. Now, how authorities treat victims not only affects how they cope, but also how they rebuild their world. And this has implications at the level of society. Um, the absence of justice diminishes uh, victims' willingness to report crimes to the police in the future. This was something that was mentioned in one of the first presentations as, as well. The other day I talked about poly-victimization and how the fact that someone has been a victim in the past is one of the better predictors of the risk of victimization in the future. Now if you combine with that the fact that if they've had negative experiences or uh, with the criminal justice system in the past that they're less likely to report crime in the future, this is very, very important in terms of undermining the state's control over or ability to react to crime within our society. So it's very important to ensure that victims um, have uh, positive experiences or in the sense of feel that justice is done. And to understand then, importantly, that um, the justice is a multidimensional concept. It takes on many forms and it's much more than simply sa sentencing and sanctioning offenders. It's much richer than that. The state will undermine uh, its ability to provide justice to victims until it recognizes the full meaning of justice. And focusing on punishment only undermines the ability of state to provide justice to victims. So that's it within the time. I thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. And indeed, all our speakers very much on time. And our last speaker, Professor Vondana Pulkayasta. She's professor of sociology and Asian American studies from the University of Connecticut in the USA. She has built up a research trajectory that focuses on migrants and migration, violence and peace, substantive access to human rights and transnationalism. Educated in India and in the US, her work aims to constantly challenge global knowledge hierarchy. Her research on violence, which is conceptualized 
as a continuum from domestic to state-sponsored violence and on mechanism for building and sustaining peace, which is multidisciplinary and multi-country conversations. Along with her research on violence, she investigated the so-called soft structures that share our knowledge of violence. She has been recognized through multiple local and national awards for her leadership, teaching, and mentoring. Bondana serves as the, served as the president of sociologists for women in society, and currently she is the American Sociological Association's representative to ISM. Please, thank you. Over the last few decades, headline news and social media around the world have featured men, women, and children who've been fleeing large-scale violence, disasters, and loss of prospects of livelihood. Their search, that is the search of the people who are on the move for safer havens, have been interrupted by the expanding terrains of state security imperatives on land and on the seas to prevent these migrants from stopping in their territories or even reaching them. Incarceration within detention camps within nation states and the growth of human smuggling rings that fail to deliver on promises to move people are part of all the tapestry or part of the spaces in which migrants move. And we know that from the United Nations uh, High Commission on Refugees that about 218 million people live in places outside the places they were born. That is a population that is much greater than a whole lot of countries in the world. Uh, certainly 68 million people are refugees and have been forced off you know, their homelands or have been made stateless. And many of them have perished trying to reach safer havens again. And I'm going to leave this picture up in a minute. This has been circulated widely. Uh, it's, it's not something that I can face for a long time, nor do you have to. But my discussion of justice today, which will be based on my own work on human rights, and particularly looking at USA's human rights records, is going to focus on examples and migrants. And I look at the case of migrants in the US and look at the kind of violence that they face and an escalation of violence at this moment within a condition of declining democracy in order to point out that what is happening in terms of violence to migrants is not something that is just relegated to migrants. It's a very short step from being a migrant to becoming a denaturalized citizen. So this first picture, which I took, it's a Reuters photograph that was published in um, New York Times. Um, it shows you know, young children in a detention camp. So the number, the mandatory detention of asylum seekers in the southern boundary of the USA has certainly escalated in recent times. However, it's not a new phenomenon. USA has invested a lot of time and money into convincing countries in the Central American region, including Mexico and other countries, to take strong measures from preventing people from getting to that border at the US. And that is part of what we are talking about when, we, when I said that it, the movement of people and the violence they encounter therefore being, becomes a function not simply of what governments are doing to repel migrants, but it's also a function of who actually moves the people because smuggling has become one of the biggest businesses after drug dealing in the world today. It makes a lot of money and the product for profiteering is off these people. Here is this other picture that appeared in New York Times and you know I put in the photographer who've taken it but this captures, well, it's a little Honduran girl crying as her mother is searched at the border. 
And this picture particularly, along with the voices of crying children in detention centers, engendered a lot of uh, pushback by people within the US who said, this is immoral, this is in our, not in my name. However, the point that I'm going to make over and over again is that when situations like this happen, we cannot necessarily rely on what's the conventional justice system. Here is a little child, I, I tried very hard, actually there's a YouTube video connected to it, but I won't show you that. I tried very hard to find a picture of his feet. He is young enough that his feet are nowhere close to the ground. He is there in a court representing himself in an immigration hearing. And not only is this an established process of providing justice, what has happened also in the US is that the courts are being forced to provide expedited judgments, which means it violates the central pr principle of any justice system in any civilized society that says you have the right to a trial, you have to be, you know, there has to be a considered opinion that says whether have you violated the laws or not. But the this whole little step of make it an expedited process just means that the court system is under pressure from the government to become an arm of that, those bureaucracies that are interested in just getting rid of people. You don't have time, make an up-down decision, let them go. No details matter, the human being doesn't matter. I'm going to leave this picture up as I talk a little bit more um, about migrants because this, these are historic pictures from the time of the Second World War when people of Japanese origin, two thirds of whom were Japanese citizens, a lot, I would say the vast majority, almost 80% of the two thirds who were Japanese citizens were born in the United States. They were basically denaturalized, if that, that word can be used for them. Tagged, if you look in the first picture, there is a, this is a kind of tag we attach to our luggage. Tagged, forced into detention centers in deserts, behind barbed wires. And the point I want to emphasize before I go into a discussion of violence is that this is the short step between who is a migrant, who is a citizen, and who are we all in this era of esca escalating violence. Now, before I move into the issue of violence, which I want to spend a few minutes on, I want to say that, um, you know, uh, we, we could come to a very, you know, quick decision and say, but, you know, now after World War II, when, you know, that internment happened, uh, we have a whole nother place to go for justice or seek justice. And that comes from the human rights charters, the conventions, the building of the international criminal justice system. And indeed, all of that is in place. And through the UN, as more and more countries begin to repel migrants, begin to detain migrants, begin to treat migrants, as far less than human, the UN at the least has been pointing out that countries that have signed onto conventions on migrant rights are actually violating their own, you know, principled signatures by pushing people back into places where they are open to harm. Um, the stage on which all of this is working out for migrants, of course, has to do with a large number of other measures that states are taking to en enhance the context of violence. And I'm going to talk about that before I come back to the issue of justice. And I'm going to do it very quickly. A quick definition when I talk about migrants, I don't have to time to talk about them all, but I'm talking about all of these migrants. Our sociological literature is much too fragmented into these categories. And we have entire streams of researchers who are doing one thing or another. And it does not make sense if you look at this context of violence in which any of these occur. 
Um, I put down two references. Current sociology monograph for March 2018 actually has, that's a special issue on just this topic. Okay, how do I come to this idea of violence from two sources? One is the feminist research on violence, which has long talked about how the public spheres and what happens in the public spheres really intersects with the private spheres. And I know President Abraham has done a lot of work on that and how that you know, leads to emotional, physical, and sexualized violence. But I also really want you to take a look, I won't read them out, um, this, the points about routine violence. This is the work coming out from India, although Gananda Pandey, when he wrote this book on routine violence, was in the US at that time. But basically the idea is that the larger the institution is that's committing the violence, the more normalized it seems. It doesn't feel like violence at that level because it happens all the time. And there's a legitimate body um, actually doing the violence. The point of course is for the people experiencing the violence, it is a whole different story. This is the main part of what I have very little time, so I'm going to go over this very quickly. This actually shows you the escalation of the structures of violence. So most of you recognize the, uh, you know, the enhancement of arms sales, starting of wars, because if you don't start wars and foment conflict, you can't sell arms. And all of those conditions that start migrants of to flee their own places in the first place. That, that's just part of this tapestry. The other part is the expansion of the sphere and escalation of the scope of routine violence. So if you define at the state level, migrants as being somebody else, and of course right now in the US at the highest level, we are talking of migrants as animals infesting the country, um, but even without going into that, you, you can change the definitions of migrants' lives. So migrants, any act that violates any rule can become a criminal issue. Migration itself gets criminalized. Once it's criminalized, the consequences of that criminalization are very important. Weaponizing language that uh, Professor Celine Marie Pascal has talked about, um, just the language of hate and bigotry uh, that is used, that is used over and over again to create fake news, to create propaganda. This contributes to who you end up being and who you see yourselves in society. And even the people who are refugees, whom countries like to say that this is where we are great, uh, are not immune to any of this weaponized language or any of these. Most of the detention centers and the prisons are getting privatized, which means the state is not directly responsible for anything that happens in those centers. Another part of something that's very important. Um, states have begun to encourage and encourage vigilante action, ignore vigilante action, and if vigilante action happens, if depending on who you are, you can be pardoned. So it's that cumulative sphere of violence within which we need to think about justice. Justice for what? It has to be about human security. Whether you're a migrant or a citizen, it's an immaterial issue human lives that are free from constant threats of violence, human lives that are secure, that are, you know, from threats derived from economic, food, health, environmental issues, or threats to personal or community or political insecurity are real. They're experienced all the time, and this is what people strive for when they are trying to seek justice. So in our own work on human rights, and once again, my focus on human rights is on the US, we have talked about what is known as human rights enterprise. And human rights enterprise recognizes that of course states, at least democracies, have laws that are supposed to be the bulwark of the justice system. But as I just described, states are absolutely complicit in, in the violence that affects the people. So while the legal system might offer some recourse, there are other 
you know, parts of the state system that are creating the violence. And the larger it is, the states are not going to deal with it. What about human rights regimes or the, you know, human rights charters and so on? Well, states are beginning to absolutely ignore all of their signatures with impunity. That they might have signed it, but come and make me do something and typically nothing can happen. So then how should justice be sought? And part of the human rights enterprise that we write about is that if we look historically, you need the laws, you need the charters and conventions, but at the end of the day, it has come through political organizing, grassroots organizing, people who've had very little to lose giving up even that in the quest for seeking something better. So if we are to think of justice in an era where violence has become so routinized that the very mechanism or the very institutions that are supposed to provide justice become the ones that are the purveyors of violence and injustice, then we have to think of justice as something that is a dynamic state that always has to be claimed, that we always have to be vigilant about, and we always have to keep pushing states and other large entities because it's no longer just states, it's states, it's corporations, it's you know criminal gangs, it's other entities that, that are fomenting and facilitating the violence. We, that is every one of us, have to be part of a very active justice system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we still have probably five minutes. We can take one or two questions if, if there is a, any burning question to ask right now. If you wish, you can approach the microphone. Okay. In that case, I am. Is there a question? Please approach the microphone. Thank you very much for all the very interesting intervention you, you made. I have a question for um, uh, Johan Bremer uh, about your very interesting work. Um, it's about the fact that your in your work has some, I would say, contested parallels, maybe with. Um, um, oh, sorry. Uh, some contested parallels with uh, regards to intimate partner violence, and I would ask you, like, how does justice can meet both the um, need of victim and also the need of society when they are sometimes contested or maybe contrasted? <coughs> like, often victim calls the police to make the violence stop, but um, don't want to go through the well, all uh, criminal procedure and um, the risk of mandatory arrest and mandatory prosecution raised by several feminist scholars um, is that it frees the victims' empowerment and can also prevent them uh, from calling the police until violence is not escalating um, toward very serious violence. So, can, can, can I please ask? Keep questions very short yeah. because we really yeah. okay. short of time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question, and I'll try to answer that. Um, particularly, um, one of the things that I think it's very interesting, the point you raised, is that victims go to the criminal justice system, particularly in the case of intimate par partner violence, looking for safety, protection in particular. And what's interesting is after that, the criminal justice system gets its hands on it, and it's all about criminalization. And I think that that is really also echoed, although it wasn't the main topic of my presentation today, this notion of you have to, um, the, the victim-centered approach, where you bear in mind why are victims coming and, and how can we meet the needs of victims. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean criminalization and punishment, um, but sometimes looking at her needs in terms of safety and security. And I think that that's where there's a conflict between the needs of the victim and the focus of the state, which is that to criminalize rather than to protect victims. And that's the short answer without getting into a long dissertation. Thank you. And on this note, please join me in thanking our speakers.
we are out of time. And I'm sure they'll be delighted to continue conversation in more informal settings.